All right, welcome to our last LEC EPD seminar of the semester. Um, just a quick reminder, as always, we'll have time for questions at the end and I'll pass around the microphone. So please hold your questions until after the talk. And afterwards, please join us across the hall for uh, refreshments and a chance to chat more with you, our speaker if you'd like. So I'm excited to welcome today our speaker, Dr. John DeLong. Um, John did his PhD at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque and went on to do a postdoc at Yale University, and he is now a professor at the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and he's also the director of Cedar Point Biological Station. And I'm especially excited to have John here with us today because he was my PhD advisor, so it's extra special to have him here at WashU. Um, so thank you for joining us, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, I feel like I'm way up tall here, huh? Because that's normal. You guys are used to that. Um, it's great meeting some of you guys for the first time, seeing some of my favorite friends who I haven't seen for a while. And uh, it's been a really wonderful day so far. So um, uh, get get into my talk here. So I'm going to talk about something that I'm really actively trying to grow, right? Um, it might seem a little bit like a tool at points, right? But it's a tool that hopefully will have a lot of use. And basically what I'm after in the big picture, right, is being able to model the tangled bank, right? Trying to get into evolution, um, ecology and evolution really, uh, in multi-species, multi-trait and non-equilibrium systems. So if I can make this work, I'm sure that I can if I do that. Right. I will start with a proverbial tangled bank, right? So what does that mean, right? This is just a spot. This happens to be on the south shore of Lake Ogallala at Cedar Point, right? This spot is covered with all sorts of things, wallflowers, poison ivy and grasses and arachnids and insects and lizards and snakes and birds and mammals and all sorts of stuff coming through here, right? It's really complicated, you know, even, even in a tiny little spot, right? It's really complicated. And of course, the tangled bank metaphor comes from Darwin, who said it's interesting to consider a tangled bank and, of course, all the complexities that that involves. And, you know, I think, of course, he was struck by the idea that something as simple as natural selection might be able to account for a large amount of that variation in what we see in nature. But, you know, right after the word interesting, when I'm thinking about a tangled bank, I think overwhelming, right? You know, that's too much, right? As, you know, uh, it's a lot to even think about a little bit of what's going on in there. And of course, evolutionary biology has proceeded through the decades by simplifi simplifying the scope of what we've been working on. We work on a species or a pair of interacting species, maybe a gene or set of genes, right? We assume ecological equilibrium almost out of course, right? Certainly we do in theory. Um, but the table bank is still what's out there, right? It demands that we you know, we get a little bit out of the simplification mindset and try to expand a little bit to try to understand what's going on in complex ecological scenarios. And I'm not going to say that I can do that, right? Um, but I do think we can take a baby step in that direction, right? Uh, and I'm going to take a baby step with something that I call uh, Gillespie Eco-Evolutionary Models or GEMS. All right, so today's talk is going to be about the GEM approach. I'm going to tell you what that is, right? And then I'm going to go into a couple of little vignettes, things that we've learned by using this tool, uh, something about what I call non-equilibrium evolutionary attractors, right? An alternative to evolutionary, evolutionary stable strategies, right? Viable eco-evolutionary pathways, like actually permissible pathways of evolution that occur when populations don't actually go extinct. Um, something I'm, you know, dear to my heart is uh, predators and how they, uh, uh, how their foraging evolves, and whether or not there's actually much pressure uh, for predators to evolve specializations or remain uh, generalists. And then uh, lots of ongoing things. I'll just mention a couple of them at the end. All right. So chapter one. What is this thing, right, that I'm talking about? Gems, right? Gems are computational analog to natural selection. It'll make more sense in a second. Uh, what they do is simulate an ordinary differential equation model, right? That allows them to evolve without explicitly directing them to do that, right? And that's an important 
point, right? Normally, in the quantitative genetics model, or lots of ways we, we think about um, modeling evolution, we have to write down equations for it, right? That is a limitation. It makes it hard to do it in complicated situations, right? We actually get to bypass that entirely, right? And so we get to study eco-evolutionary dynamics in complex scenarios. We can basically add as many species as we want, think about as many traits as we want, without having the limitations of writing it all down. So I'm going to take a, a moment to deep dive you into the mechanics of this so you understand what I'm talking about. And then we'll kind of come back so you don't have to think about that part anymore. Right, so what am I talking about, right? An ordinary differential equation, right? Here's an example. This is a lockable predator prey equation. You probably have seen that. They're used very, very widely in ecology and evolution. And they're basically um, tracking the change of some state variable through time, right? So in this case, our prey is our resource, which you can think of as a roadrunner. Right, and I have an equation that says the abundance of my roadrunners changes through time, basically from the difference of the first and the death rate. And inside these little boxes, you can write whatever functions you really like. Right, in this case, it's blockable terra again, it's exponential growth, it's a type one function response. It's not really relevant, you know, that it just happens to be what it wrote down. But any kind of model that you're interested in or your favorite model can go into here. And then here's your consumer, which you think of as coyotes, the change in the coyotes through time, right? They have births and deaths too. And in this particular case, right, like births of coyotes are, yeah, coyotes come from eating road runners and then they coyotes die, right? So this produces your classic oscillatory predator prey dynamics that goes back to the 20s from Gauss and Bacco and Volterra, right? In a normal way of, of understanding this kind of model would be to numerically solve it. Right, stick it in your favorite computer program, and it's going to give you a trajectory of R and C through time. Right, and the way that works basically is you are assuming that everything's per capita, right? And I can have any fractional fractional amount of coyotes I want, and all that changes is because R and C change through time. My growth rate changes. So what happens in a solver is at any given moment. I take the number of coyotes and I multiply it by the per capita death rate, and I get this smooth, in this case, I'm just going to talk about death. I get this smooth decline of coyotes through time. That's what numerical solutions give you. That's not really how you know populations work. You you die and you lose an individual, and then you know some another individual dies and you step down, right? You don't lose a quarter of an individual at a moment, right? Anything like that. So ODEs are approximations of dynamics that occur. So the Gillespie actually kind of reverses course and simulates your ODE, right? And the way that works, and I'm going to talk about this as the original Gillespie um, algorithm first, which came from chemistry, you know, to talk about stochastic chemical reactions, and then was borrowed by ecology. Right? And basically it says, okay, I have all these rates, but all those rates actually represent things that happen in nature, right? Births, deaths, demographic events. So I can just transform this whole thing from rates into events, right? And rates are things for time. So I'll just turn it over and look at the time at which it takes events to happen. And the way I do that is I basically, well, I, I sum up all of these things. And I, for example, take my death rate and divide it by all of the possible rates of things that can happen. And that's about as fast that well, if I do that for everything, I can kind of create this pie of rates. And that tells me basically what the likelihood of any particular rate or event is happening at any given time. So right now, I see that my death rate is a large slice of the pie. The death rate is the most common rate. It's the most common event. Sorry, sorry. Death is the most common event in my population at this moment, which means it has a relatively high rate, right? And what I do is I can basically spin my pie like a wheel of fortune, boom, and it'll land somewhere. And wherever it lands, that's what's going to happen in my Gillespie simulation. Right. So right now, the most likely thing that happens is going to be a death. So as this day I spin it and I land on a death, I'm going to take an individual away. And then I get an advanced time. And advancing time, it comes from a kind of a, a, a strange little algorithm that uh, invokes the property of times being distributed as an exponential. right? Um, and we can determine the average how advanced time step that we would do from all these rates. And I won't go into math that. But I'm going to calculate tau exactly from all of those things over here. I'm going to advance time and remove my individual. So, um, for example, the first time I go through, I'm coming along. I have some C, 
I lose an individual and then I advance tau. And then I'm going to go back and do it again because I just changed three. So I'm going to change all these rates. So now I'm going to have different pi slices. I'm going to spin it again. Something's going to happen. And if it's another death, I'm going to drop another individual and then I'm going to pull t tau again in advance. And so you get something that looks like the numerical solution, like a slow drop in my consumer. But here I'm stepping down. You with me on that? So this is what this is the kind of thing that really happens in nature. ODEs are a simulation of that. And in a little bit of an ironic twist of fate, the Gillespie comes back and simulates the <laughs> approximation, which I think is kind of funny. <laughs> Okay, so if you were to go through this Gillespie algorithm, you know, crank this wheel over and over again, you get an, an outcome that's a stochastic, basically a noisy version of your numerical simulation. And every time you do it, it looks a little different than the last time. But if you do it enough times, the average of all those little sto noisy trajectories pretty much works out to be exactly the same as that numerical solution, except in the cases where you have extinctions because things have gone rare. In an ordinary differential equation model, you can't really have extinctions. You can have, you know, 0. 0.00001 coyotes in the population, and they can still come back, right? You know, in, in a Gillespie, that can't happen. You go to zero, and you can't spontaneously create new coyotes, right? Um, so you do have some differences between the way the two algorithms come out, um, but it's primarily due to stochastic extinctions. Now, again, this is just ecological, right? There's only one thing you need to do to turn this into an evolutionary algorithm. And that is to take all of the, one of these parameters or all of them in my model, whichever your model is, and take it and from a constant, which is the way we would normally do this, and turn it into a distribution. So that means that let's just say I have death again, right? And I have a distribution of values. That means that I have some individuals that are highly likely to die and some individuals that are likely to survive for a long time. And when I go through my algorithm, I also randomly draw from that distribution at each time step. So if I happen to pick an individual with a high you know, death rate, it's very likely to be removed from the population. And it, you know, the opposite would be true. If I happen to pick an individual that has a high likelihood of birth, it's very likely to be landed on you know, as a birth, and we're going to have a, a new individual added to the population. And with some kind of rule about how it, offspring look like their parents, we generally use quantitative genetics for this, right? A parent offspring regression model to make this work. But you could use a variety of things. As soon as you have those two things, uh, which are two ingredients in natural selection, right? This is automatically evolutionary. As you go through the ratchet, the algorithm, you add individuals with high fitness traits and you subtract individuals with low fitness traits. And the ecological interaction itself is telling you what that is. And I have written no equations for selection gradients or quantitative genetics, Landy Arnold types of, you know, G matrices have not done any of that. It all comes out because evolution is happening because of demographic outcomes. That's what fitness is anyway. And so that demographic variation is determining both my ecological and my evolutionary dynamics. It's why you can do complex scenarios with this because it's relatively simple. Every single one of those parameters can be allowed to evolve at one time with no extra math, right? Which is a really huge game. So I'll give you, I'll run you through like an example of what this might look like. Hey, there's a, an organism. <laughs> I wonder what its survival is like. Uh, okay, so I'm going to give you the simplest scenario that I can give, which is essentially logistic growth. Um, and as you guys know, in logistic growth, right, you have a birth rate in this blue line and a death rate, and then um, this yellow line that are dependent on how many individuals are in the population at one at that time. And where those two lines cross, birth rates equal death rates. That's what we call a carrying capacity, right? And we can write that down mathematically as lines like this. Note, um, if you are math phobic, just think about this whole thing here as R. It's just exponential growth. But as soon as you make them density dependent, you have um, logistic growth. So again, it's an ODE change in my R abundance 
through time, and it's going to go to a carrying capacity. I'm going to mark this out a little bit. I have my death rate line here and my birth rate line there. This is still just births minus deaths times R. And if I put this in a gem and I say my death rate is what I want to evolve, sure enough, I just started up here at 23, it goes down. Right? Of course it does, right? You know, survival is good, right? You know, that you would expect evolution to favor higher survival individuals. Nothing weird here, but um, what you should really notice is how much noise there is in that across different runs. And all that noise is not something I told it to do. That's all coming from randomness, demographic stochasticity, right? Just variation in the sequence of births and deaths through time. And that's producing a massive amount of variation, right? We could have trajectories that basically don't hardly evolve at all just by chance, even though the pressure is clearly there for there to be evolution. And that this is paired with the change in the abundance. This um, dashed orange line would be our original um, ordinary differential equation logistic growth. You start the population somewhere, it grows, it levels off at K, which is this black line. But because this population is evolving, lowering its death rate, it actually, the carrying capacity goes up through time. So the uh, population grows and then actually continues above carrying capacity because carrying capacity is actually being updated. Right. All right, so that's the simplest possible gem kind of example I can give you, right? Um, really fast, really easy to do. Um, ah, that's why K is a dependent on our death. Okay. Um, something I just did a couple of days ago, hopefully I mean, we'll see based on your reaction if this is helpful or not. Um, I've always wanted to make a little movie of the changes in distributions of traits through time, because really, when you're thinking about evolution, I, I think you should be thinking about how distributions change, right? We, we often think about means, but really we're, what's actually happening out there is when you gain or lose individuals, you gain, you change the shapes of distributions of those traits. Right, so just a quick little movie that says, is it gonna work? Where's my little thing? Oh, it worked. Well, that's a gem. Um, I didn't know it was gonna work. It's pretty fast. I can do it again. It starts off in blue, the distribution. This is a mortality rate um, evolution of a predator. And you can see that in the beginning, we have, um, it goes from blue early to red late. So the beginning, uh, we have uh, a lot of high mortality individuals. You can see that basically it's favoring the side of the distribution of lower, uh, of higher survivor individuals. Let's see if I can do that again. All right. And the other thing I like about that is that it's not a normalized distribution. The area under the curve is also changing as the population changes size, right? So if your population is growing, you're adding individuals in some area, declining the amount of others. But this is what's really happening whenever you see a line that says a trait is changing. Okay. You guys didn't seem to get too angry about that. Maybe, maybe it's okay. <laughs> okay, so um, are you with me on like what gems are and what, how they work? Okay, so I'll go into a uh, case study um, that I did with C Clay Kressler in our department at UNL. Something that we sort of stumbled upon. We had a different um, in goal in the beginning something that we're calling non-evolutionary equilibrium tracks. And uh, I'm gonna start with some models here first, cause um, I think we have to, right? This is that um, equation that I showed you before, so it's logistic growth, right? We know what that looks like. I showed you what that looks like. And we were interested to know in the beginning whether the GEM approach, you know, gave the same answers as more widely used approaches like quantitative genetics, so Landy Arnold, Landy Abrams types of models, right? So we were just, and, and the reason why, just as an aside for anybody who's like developing a career, is all of the reviewers that we kept uh, getting for our early papers told us we had to do that because they didn't believe that our method worked. So we were like, okay, we'll do that. And then when we did that, we discovered something. So a little aside. So um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to look at the evolution of this Bmax trait here, my maximum birth rate. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that there's a trade-off between your birth rate and your death rate, meaning that if you invest a lot in births, that maybe you're not going to survive so well. And that that trade-off is 
accelerating, right? So you can invest a little bit more in births and you don't pay a huge cost, but at some point when you start investing a lot in births, you start paying a huge cost, right? So this is squared function. So our trade-off looks like this, right? Um, it could be any function you want, but it's really just mathematically tiny if we make that choice. And then I'm going to so sort that into here, d min into d min. I'm going to get this equation here. <laughs> Starting to look a little ugly. It's okay. It's still all logistic growth. I'm going to carry it over here. And now um, I'm going to show you how we would look at this from a quantitative genetics point of view. The first thing we would do is we'd make the assumption that fitness in this model is the mean per capita growth rate. You've probably come across that, right? If I take my model and I divide it through by my R, I get one over R dr to P, and that's the per capita growth rate. And so fitness we know is a relative difference among individuals, but in quantitative genetics land, right, we can identify something called a mean fitness. And that's what this is. So what we want to know is how does my mean fitness change? What's happening to that? And so the typical way you would do this, right, is basically you take um, the derivative of this equation with respect to my trait, right? So little, little d of my mean fitness with respect to the little b max, right? How does my fitness change as my trait changes? That's what we would do. And it turns out to be, you know, pretty easy function, right? The derivative of my trait of b max with respect to b max is one, Right, B max isn't in there, so that's zero. B max is there. Okay, two S B max, right? That would be that. And B max isn't in there, and that's zero too, right? So you guys remember your calculus rules, it simplifies into this nice little expression. But because, uh, oh, sorry. And then if I rearrange and I solve for my B max, right, at the point where uh, if I set this equal to zero and I solve for it, I get this. This means that my B max, my birth rate is maximized at this value one over two S, right? And two is coming from there and S is this little trade-off constant. So it's a recap, right? If I invoke a trade-off in which you die more when you breed more, right? Um, you create an optimal value at which there is an optimal set of births and deaths for fitness. If you go higher than that, you die more than you um, need to. And you go low that, you don't breed as much as you could. You with me on that? So this is pretty classic stuff, right? And so that tells me that in this kind of modeling framework, I should expect, you know, my model to tell uh, my population to evolve towards this value of 1 over 2s. And if I drop it into a gem, right, this is what I get. I get this logistic-y looking growth. And my trait, if I started down here, it grows up to this point here. And it turns out that point is exactly my quantitative genetics evolutionary, evolutionary stable strategy. And the orange line is actually what a, a Landy Abrams type quantitative genetics model would give. Okay, it looked very much the same. So hopefully first pass at least, I convinced you that Gems will give you the same answer as all the classic things. So great, why do I need to go through all this? <laughs> right? Well, complexity and stochasticity, as I mentioned in the very beginning, right? So what we wanted to then find out is if the, we could just sort of amplify the stochasticity if it would give you the same thing, right? If we amplify the stochasticity, not by changing a number like a stochasticity number, but just by lowering the population size. Smaller populations have greater noise in them, right? So what we did is we started it with a K of 40, and this is the same kind of thing that I just showed you, and everything seems to converge. I'm going to tell you this is my knee. I'm going to tell you, explain that in just more detail in just a second. But if I make the population even smaller, you start to see now things start to happen, right? My gem is predicting a value less than the ESS. Okay, that when we first saw that, we were like, uh, we we've done the code wrong, right? That's that can't be right. But we kept doing it, we kept looking at it, and then uh, we kept doing this, and we made the k even lower, and it goes even farther down. We're like, oh, okay. so now we have to figure out what's going on. Why don't I understand, right? And what we did is we went back to math, of course, and we reminded ourselves that in the beginning we said, okay. Quantitative genetics tells us there's a certain way of identifying an ESS. 
but it's not the only way that you can write down fitness. So we're like, well, what's, what's, what's another way? <laughs> another way is lifetime reproductive success. This is a fantastic way to write down um, fitness, right? Lifetime reproductive success is your expected um, reproduction over essentially your death rate. One of your death rate is survival, right? So how long do you expect to be alive? How many offspring do you expect to have in that time frame? And that's LRS. And that is actually determinable directly from the equation that we already wrote down. So we don't have to do anything else. We can do this. And I'm going to spare you the derivative. But if you go through that same process I went through with a classic approach, you end up with a different optimum for B max, right? And actually, it looks really ugly. But if you put in carrying capacity into that, it, it simplifies down to exactly the same thing as quantitative genetics ESS would tell you. But if you're not at your ecological equilibrium, right, this is one of the things I'm after, your best trait depends on how big your population size is. Right? So that's already a step away from ESS thinking. Right? Like, wait a minute, if my population is not equilibrium, my trait should not go to an ESS. Um, OK, where is it going to go? OK, well, this can tell us. And if you're not at equilibrium, you know, this, there is an attractor. It's there, and we're, we're going to call that a meat. And is that where we went? Yes, that's basically where we went. That pink line is our knee. You can see it's still hanging a little bit below, right? And that could be attributed to a little bit of stochasticity and noise. But basically, the classic approach says the population, no matter what your population is doing, should always go to an ESS, and that's that value right there. But an alternative approach says, actually, that best value changes depending on where your population is hanging. And in this case, the population is hanging low in all cases just because of stochasticity. I'm going to say that again, just make sure it's holding together. Stochasticity, just demographic stochasticity, we know this mathematically, right, tends to place a drag on population growth. And because of that, the av actual average abundance the population is not going to carrying capacity. Because of that, the best trait is not the ESS. And you can't get to that from classic quantitative genetics, but it comes out without even trying with the gem. And in fact, that's the only reason why we know it, because we weren't trying. Um, one alternative is that you could say, well, this is just uh, you know, uh, genetic drift. It just can't get to the ESS because of drift. So we just did a little experiment to test that idea, right? And this is kind of recapitulating what we did um, in the previous um, figure. And instead of starting the trait down here, we started it above. And if it was just drift, it should have a hard time getting down to the ESS. But it just goes right by it and hangs out with the knee the whole time. So we know it's not that. It's not just drift. It actually, the populations are evolving to a non-ESS state. And okay, so that's interesting to me because until we figured that out, like I thought ESS is worth everything, right? Like I was like, ESS, that's what we should be always assessing, right? And in fact, if you look in the literature, you'll find that a lot of people are wringing their hands over populations that are going to non-ESS states and thinking that what's happening is that they're maladaptive. Lots of fisheries are, are observing this kind of thing, thinking, oh, these, these things are maladaptive. They're not going to their ESSs. I don't know this to be the case, but I think it's quite possible that they're going to these, right? That there's actually, they're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. It's just that we have defined the optimum incorrectly because we assumed ecological equilibrium and we ignored stochasticity. Two features, what I would say, are really relevant to a tangled bay. Okay, uh, we'll talk about something I call viable eco-evolutionary pathways, work that I did with a postdoc in my lab um, named Kyle Koblenz. And to do this, we have to start a little bit in, in foraging ecology. So sorry uh, for those of you who've seen this, we talk about this too many times. But we're going to talk about the functional requirement, which is the rate of um, foraging or kill rate or prey uptake, whatever you like, with respect to prey density. And it's usually some kind of increasing and saturating curve like this. Right. If there's no prey, obviously your rate has to be zero. So this thing has to start at the origin. And if you are overwhelmed with prey, right, you're probably not going to be able to keep eating forever. Think of it as Thanksgiving dinner, uh, dinner effect. Right. So there should be some saturation. 
And the typical equation we use for this is this thing here called the Hauling disk equation, right? Um, or the type two functional response. It has two important parameters, A and H, and you can see those readily in the figure, right? A is the slope of this line as it goes through the origin. You can tell that because when R gets really, really small, this whole thing, this whole thing goes to one, which means you're left with AR, okay? And you can see that the handling time is H up here because one over H is set to this asymptote to which the line approaches. Okay, so we have two parameters that are very widely studied. People estimate these things from thousands of experiments that have been done, right? And we consider them to be like the core link in food web interactions. And we also think that generally better predators should be selected for which means that they should have a higher A and a lower H, meaning steeper and higher, meaning eat more across all densities. You think that should be good for a predator, right? But then prey, pulling in the other direction, prey are involved in this, and we think that natural selection should, you know, should select for better prey, which means a lower A and a lower handling time, meaning that they are managing to avoid getting predated at all levels. So, <laughs> So we expect A and H, we have expectations for how A and H should evolve. Um, okay, so we're gonna look at a fitness sort of landscape of A and H. I call A space clearance rate and A H is handling time. And we know again that a better predator should be one with a low handling time and a high space clearance rate. So basically if you were to look at this landscape and you would start a population here, it should basically just go up this hill. Right, that should be what it does, right? But it turns out that on this landscape, you can have perfectly genetically viable functional individuals over here, but if your population sits over here, it's going to go extinct. It's going to have too many cycles that go too far down close to zero, and they're going to blink out at you. And down here, if you're down in this space, actually, the predators can't even support themselves, so they're going to go extinct. So there's this sort of narrow range in which um, pop the population, the predator population in this case, can travel without going extinct, even though the pressure is for it to cross this valley here. So what is that? What's what's going to happen, right? If you try to evolve this population? Well, we did that using gems. We sort of parameterized the system. We started a population here and we let it go. Right, and what you need to see, again, is space clearance right over there, handling time here, these are all possible function response combinations. And the darker this background color is, is the more, you know, the, the more likely the population went extinct. So you can see that all this black area here, population, this can't support themselves. And so they can stay, they can persist in these blue areas. And so we're like, all right, well, what happens? <laughs> you know, can this population do? Anything? Can it evolve uphill? I don't know. Um, so we started it here, and then the um, ones that survive are these green dots, and the ones that went extinct are these pink X's there, right? So what you should see is that a lot of them went extinct, right? First of all, extinction was really common. But though, if you were going to stay alive, you basically were, you know, adhered to this part of this landscape, right? Anything that basically crossed this white line most of those things just blinked right out. If we look at this in a little more granular detail, right? Um, the X's and the dots are still there, but these are the mean trajectories of the extant one. And this is the mean trajectory of the extinct one. And what you see is that you could do either way with the same exact parameters, everything's the same in this model, just by random chance alone, a lot of these populations go extinct, but some of them, by random chance alone, I'm saying that again, so just so cast to see, they can go around the bend. Right. And so this to me is super fascinating because, you know, again, quantitative genetics tells me, you know, I have a certain kind of pressure and that's what I should expect to happen. But actually, you know, that can create all sorts of problems. But the whole process itself is so noisy that you can kind of skirt around you know, those kinds of dangers. And if you look retrospective, right, if I'm like, oh, if I go out to the wild and I find these guys living out there, I would infer the wrong pa expected pathway because I'm thinking, if I'm thinking quantitative genetics, I'm thinking to get to this point, I need a landscape that looks like this, 
right? But that's not the landscape that produced that. It's only the landscape where noisily, stochastically, some things happen to go around the bend and make it. So we could easily, you know, what that means is that from today's vantage point, looking backward in time, trying to infer what has happened evolutionary to get you where you are, you could easily get the wrong answer because we're not taking account, once again, stochasticity and the evolution of, of multiple traits in this case. All right, and so another um, project I did with Kyle on multi-trait evolution, right? Um, and this is about functional responses again. So a little bit more math, so sorry if you are not liking that, um, but hopefully you're hanging in there with that part. Um, this project is about what happens when I'm a predator and I have lots of different options, right? Should I evolve to be really good at any given predator or should like the availability of additional options kind of weaken that selective force and basically not be a pressure to get good at forging on anything at all. Just kind of like forge on whatever, right? And so we were able to kind of do this by setting up this way. And here's a little bit of analytical math that just kind of tells you why it's probably going to work this way. Um, this is, again, my predator equation. Same as what I already showed you. Just kind of lockable Terra-ish with a type 2 function response. But here I've just given everything a subscript of 1. One kind of prey. Okay with that? If I do that same exercise that I did before and I looked at the selection gradient using quantitative genetics, I get the change of my fitness with the change of this trait that I'm going to have of all A, I get this expression. The only thing you really need to know in this expression is that R, my prey abundance, is squared in the denominator and um, not squared in the top, which means that the more R there are, the smaller that selection gradient is going to be. With me on that, right? Add prey gets weaker. If I now add different kinds of prey, and I'll just do this with two, right? I got the same model there. I'm going to do the same exercise. And again, the only thing you really have to see is, well, I've got all my prey down here that are squared, and they're still not squared up there. So if I add more prey or add more types of prey, selection on the steepness of my function response should get weaker and weaker and weaker. Just keep adding prey, that square is just going to keep that flattening out. So what I should expect if I can model um, uh, the evolution of this A parameter, my space clearance right through time with varying amounts of prey, I should see that you know it should get weaker if I add more prey types. And that's exactly what happens, right? Well, there's one more little bit. Actually, did the fitness gradients here for you. So you can see that that's what I told you verbally. So I'm going to skip that now. Now here's the gem results. So over here I have time, and I have my space clearance rate through time, and it's going up. And that's exactly what we think should happen. Predators should get better at what they do, right? And this is zero here because I, I just normalized everything to zero to account for variation and starting point. Um, and then if I stick in a second prey type and I take that same paint line at the same paint line, you can see that actually these yellow and blues, which I'll explain in just a second, um, they are not going as fast as that paint line. What does that mean? Yeah, my pressure to get better at eating anything is just weaker. They're getting better at eating things. They're just doing it more slowly. But if I add four, it gets shallower. And I get eight, it gets even shallower. And you can keep going. Obviously, it's going to get to the point where it's flat. So it's doing exactly what we expect, right? As a foraging ecologist, I generally have this sense that my predators should be really good at what they do. But actually, if my predators are out there eating like 30 different things, I guess my new thinking is that actually there's no pressure for them to get any better. <laughs> they should basically just kind of randomly find and eat whatever they can, right? Um, the yellow and the blue um, um, are... I, I pulled out, identified the two, the most rewarding prey in my set um, at that simulation and the least rewarding. And I did that by taking the, um, the classical optimal foraging ratio of their energy gain, basically how, how much birth you can get out of that prey um, over the handling time, how long it takes to process that. So um, classic expression of like net energy gain for any particular prey. So 
um, in this particular case, I'm randomizing parameters as I go through here. So this is covering a huge amount of parameter space. And so the fact that it's still doing it is pretty, pretty robust to variation in parameters. But at that time, at each run, I grab whoever's the best prey and whoever's the worst prey, and then I categorize them that way. And so you can see, actually, they do get better at foraging on the best prey over than the worst prey, which to me was the most exciting thing maybe that, that, I, that I came out of this, even though I went in for this thing about the number of prey types, is that even with this pressure, predators can actually recognize and get better on really good prey, right? which I think is kind of a fascinating thing. It implies so much because that means they maybe they know what a good prey is. Right? That's always been a big issue for optimal foraging. Okay, so what did I just tell you? Right? I gave you a, a rundown on what the gem approach is, the mechanics, how it really works, this algorithm it rackets through. Right? I told you that there's a pretty clear alternative to evolutionary stable strategies. Me that in a non-equilibrium system, which I personally think is probably the, the default state for most ecological systems, there isn't a, the possibly the better, you know, optimal thing to think about is a knee, right? Um, and we can still understand that in simple algebraic terms, right, from the model we're using. We don't need anything more complicated to do that. Um, I mentioned this viable eco-evolutionary pathways um, example, where there are lots of reasons why predator and prey systems or any system might go extinct. And if they're going to persist, they got to find their way around those extinction holes. And actual just stochasticity can get them there. Right. But it also means there's lots of chance for things to just go extinct, to, you know, kind of have this evolutionary suicide um, kind of process that goes on. And then finally, you know, it's pretty easy to show that more prey types can relax selection on foraging and that actually maybe, you know, most the, the generic expectation for forage, you know, for thinking about predators and what they like to do out there is that they should basically eat whatever they can. Right? And the more we see in the literature and the more experiments that we do with spiders and owls and everything else, the more it seems like, yep, they eat whatever they can. So I'm trying to do a lot with this, right? Like mostly I'm trying to keep getting at fundamental things, the things that that ESSs and quantitative genetics would not have told me, right? And uh, we just keep doing that by trying out gems in different kinds of scenarios and seeing what happens. Um, but one of the things we recently did, um, you may be aware of something called long transients, right? Um, places where ecological systems spend a lot of time near um, unstable equilibria. And then could be accidentally nudged away. This is in this alternative stable states literature a lot. And we're finding that yep, evolution at those things can actually totally change the, um, the duration of long transients and how those things unfold. We're looking at the evolution of thermal niches, basically how well you do at different temperatures, a lot of parameters that can evolve there. Um, oh yeah. And I'm really trying to move in the direction of like having these models be very tightly parameterized to empirical systems, right? So we have a bunch of um, experiments on paramecium didinium predator prey dynamics. If you're not familiar with that system, they're both ciliates. Um, they go way back in ecology. Gauss was using them in the 30s. Um, so they've been used very widely. But we have experiments where we've done, we could see dynamics for different genotypes of organisms, right? And so we're going to try to parameterize our models to see if we can recapitulate what actually happens in um, in our experiments. But this is, you know, we really haven't done that yet. We're only just now at the, at the place where we can do that. But, uh, you know, I was talking to Suzanne today about doing that very sort of thing with the uh, Tibetan moth and, um, I don't remember the name of the moth. You know, there's a plant involved. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I think there's a lot of potential going forward and, I'll say one more thing about it, right? I am not trained as a mathematician, right? I do not have a math degree. I don't consider myself a very good um, mathematician at all, right? One of the things that I think GEMS does that regular theoretical ecology doesn't do is make it easy for people who aren't mathematicians to work with, right? It's really hard to understand some of that stuff. Um, and I actually think this is totally doable for anybody who can get their mind around a lockable terra model, right? So, uh, a little pitch.
Um, okay, so what is my message? Right, Jams open up a new window in detailed relation and dynamics, complex scenarios. I think there's a lot going that we can do going forward. But tons of people to thank. Some funders from BSF in Israel, McDonald Foundation, Nebraska, NSF, Stella there, lots of people who worked on different models um, with me. And then I have two more pitches. First, Cedar Point. I mentioned, uh, right, a Stella students class out there. If you come out and take a class with us, you might see Barnell, no promises, right? But we have a field ornithology class. We have an epidemiology class in the field. If you have any interest in health, this is a great class. You got limnology, herpetology. If you uh, are interested, you grab a QR code of that really quick. You could go right to our page. Is anybody doing it? No. <laughs> Fine. Talk to Stella. She'll convince you. Um, also, I want to give a pitch for Gordon Conference on what's called Unifying Ecology. It's going to be happening next summer. I'm the chair, right? We have a, we have a fancy sticker um, for the conference. If that isn't enough to get you there, I don't know what is, right? Um, maybe it's all these incredibly amazing people who are coming out to talk um, to um, at this conference. And this is a super integrative conference. It's, for me, it is the best conference I've been to. I go every two years. It covers a lot of ground, but it really is integrative. It's really trying to connect the dots. And we got people who are like proper physiologists. We got Miguel Araujo coming. We got disease ecologists. We got human um, macroecologists. It's going to be amazing, right? It's going to be in New England next summer. Um, Stella's going to be there, right? Yeah, Grady's going to be there, right? <laughs> Right. I'm going to be there. You guys should come, right? If you want to connect the dots and get sort of out of your, you know, your little bubble and think big, it's a great place to go and do that. So I'll leave that up um, uh, while I take any questions. So thanks. Question. Thanks so much for the talk. I have a question about chapter two. Um, and I was very curious about how you mentioned that there might be some systems, for example, fisheries, that might be, or we might see the presence of any EPAs instead of ESSs. And I'm just wondering if you have any predictions about how uh, first principles from community ecology or balance theory of community assembly might allow us to make some predictions about where we might see a role of drift in making it more or less likely that a, that a population, an actual empirical population might be uh, found at an, either at an NEA or at an ESS because of the measure that population size would have something to do with it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, you know, drift might be hard for me to speak to, right? Like in um, freshwater systems, things tend to be smaller except for the Great Lakes. Marine systems, populations are large. Um, so maybe less relevant just in terms of noise. But from my vantage point, you know, many fisheries are heavily harvested and they're harvested independent of their traits. I think that's the key thing. If that's the case, right, like independent of like birth rate or something like that, right? They certainly being harvested based on their size, right? Um, so, um, but if they have like a trade off, like a birth death trade off, right? And you suppress the population independent of that trait, you would definitely see a very strong movement towards a knee. And we actually did that uh, simulation. If the selection is trait dependent, then you may have direct selection, you know, for higher or lower value of that trait, depending on fishing gear or various kinds of things, right? Um, so that's the key piece. It's stochasticity is in this scenario, trait independent. Some fishing is trait independent, but some fishing is trait size dependent. So it would really depend on like the power of those harvesting forces, right? Like, so if you're, uh, let me get examples. Does that make sense? If maybe if you're, you know, if you're all fishing for, you know, I guess with stocked fisheries, I would say are off the table. Like that's just completely being flooded by fish, hatchery fish all the time, but some kind of wild fishery that's not um, being stocked a lot. Um, I guess even the marine stuff, right? Like if you're if you're using gill nets or you know various kinds of size based um, harvesting, you're going to be pulling certain traits out. I think that would overwhelm 
the randomness of any kind of knee stuff, right? Um, but I th still think it would be there because there'd be other traits in the mix because, you know, phenotypes are extremely multidimensional. So they could be still under selection. They should could still be going to optimal traits that just we don't necessarily think of as being linked to the fishery, to the harvesting. I don't know if that's what you were getting at, but no, that was not what I did not answer your question. <laughs> I can keep trying if you want. Thank you. That was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, my question is about, uh, I think that was also in the second chapter where you mentioned that uh, fisheries have uh, previously assumed that the ships are to mal adaptation, but you've seen that it's the, the option was made in ship. So is there a way in your framework we can distinguish when something is actually a trait is evolving towards mal adaptation or is it just a sampling or yeah difficulty in absolutely because you use the same kinds of information to calculate a knee as you do a traditional quantitative genetics ESS, right? You use the same bits of pieces of information that you've measured. You just do a different formula. So if you can calculate an ESS, you can calculate a knee. So, but if, if you're in a position where you can't do either, then you would, you would uh, you know, maybe have to guess, right? Um, am I getting, is that what you're asking? I'm not answering questions. Right now. Uh, you can press me, it's okay. <laughs> All the way around. All the way around. Thanks, John. Great yeah. talk. Thanks. I was curious for the optimal foraging models. Do those assume, as you increase the number of prey species, do they assume that all prey have equal relative abundance? So, what would happen in a situation where um, most prey species are rare? Do you mean in? Optimal models in general, or what I did specifically. What you did. Yeah. Okay. So if yeah. you go from one prey to whatever it was, four prey. In that case, I actually did it in two ways, right? In one way, I had a common carrying capacity, and I had to separate out the R's across the different prey types as I added more. And the other way, I let the carrying capacity go up as I added basically by setting competition coefficients as you know, closer to one or farther below one. Um, so we looked at, uh, so I think, I'm going to answer the question wrong again, um, right, uh, that's what, is that one part of what you're asking? I, I was mainly thinking like in the, as you increase prey species richness and there's one prey species that's very common. Yes. And, and all the others are rare. Would, yes. Would you still get the trait evolving in that direction? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that's exactly what, what we happened, what we did, right? So, um, I mentioned this, but I didn't go into much detail, right? So we set each one of those up by randomly parameterizing them. So, uh, and this is this is an end run around typical reviewers who want you to, you know, change. Oh, what about that parameter, right? And you don't feel like doing that, right? So I just went in from the beginning and I randomly distributed parameters across a wide space so that I would know if it was robust to that very kind of thing, right? So when you do that, you end up with different carrying capacities for each one. And so you have some common ones and you have some rare ones, right? So across all of those variations where you have maybe you know, different simulations that have even distributions of abundances and some extremely abundant, some rare ones, across all of that variation, you still got that same thing. Is that an answer? Yes, yes. I answered one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, this is also about the optimal foraging. So, um, I was just very interested in how you said that it's possible that predators are aware of what a, like the most optimal prey species is. Mm -hmm. be better at hunting that one and killing that one. If you were to reverse it, where they start off with like a large number of prey available to them and you take it down, would you expect that like one would replace 
like the second highest, the second most optimal, if you take away the first one, would then replace and it would just kind of move backwards towards that first line where they yes. get really good at hunting that. I line. think so. Yeah, and, and this is one of the, I guess I didn't talk about this, but one of the things that that um, result suggests to me is that the loss of species could tend to have the this but this feedback, right? Like if 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 I if my predator now for forages on some fewer number of species because we've had extinctions, for example, now the pressure is on that predator to get a little better at foraging these things, which means that they have stronger interactions, likely to push them into rarer states, likely to lead to more extinctions, likely to then increase the pressure on how good you are foraging on the remaining ones, creating a cycle to the point at which you could be like driving these things out faster and faster. I don't know that that's happened, but mathematically, that's exactly what would happen in this situation, right? Yeah. Hey, batteries. Any other questions? Let's well, take the day with you, batteries. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Please join us in the next